and welcome back. Uh, this is Emily Seal. This is Austin P. THEA 1030. We're moving on into Chapter 2. Sometimes the best way to define something or describe something is by explaining what it isn't. And this is a really easy mix-up to do, to call the play a movie. Um, you know, a lot of people kind of mix those two together, kind of lump them, and I believe rightly, in the same category, but one of the better ways to kind of take a fine tooth comb to theater and really look closely at it is to see what it isn't. And it's not a movie, it's not TV. So, um, one of the main ways that a movie is not TV is the audience. So, I'm going to take just a moment to slice in a clip of Hugh Jackman, who um, you may or may not know is also a star of stage. So, that yeah. cell phone episode. Yes. Um, I understand you guys were a little annoyed that, well, first of all, how did they get video of that? They shouldn't have been uh, yeah, well, recording that's a good point. that, right? Um, look, you know, uh, it's not the first barbecue for us. I mean, I know people are videoing and you can't stop it, really. I think it's, it's a shame, but that's the way things are. Luckily, I don't think people are going to not come to the theatre because they see something. Unlike the movie business, where it's very, very dangerous, you know, piracy. I think with theatre, I don't think it's going to stop people coming. Yeah, and but, what did you think of uh, of that whole episode? I, I thought it was funny. I have to say, when I came to see you, I came to a Sunday matinee, yeah. and there was some lady, I think, in the third row or something, the left side of the stage, if, if you're facing out, yeah. and uh, she was talking, or she was doing something, and it was it was distracting, because I wasn't sitting that far from her, and you started talking to her in yeah, the middle right. of the play. Do you remember that? <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, and what was she doing, by the way? I, I, it was hard for me to tell, but I, I'm pretty sure she was. She couldn't find a seat or something. And then someone else was saying, "Will you f be quiet?" And it's not like any conversation. I mean, I know I'm pretending to be someone else up there, but I'm not pretending about having a conversation. I'm really trying right. my hardest to connect with every person in the theatre. Well, you totally stayed in character. Right. When yeah. someone's talking through it, it's like, "Are you right? You want to finish? Yeah, it's up to you. Unless you got a better story, you want to tell your story." And funnily enough, it kind of breaks that fourth wall immediately and it works well. But you, you're one scene in front of me, you couldn't understand what she was saying. Well, no, no, I was, no, I just, I just I know that she was noisy. And then I thought, was noisy. it an elderly person who was having trouble? I just couldn't figure well, it out. I but was, I thought you handled it really well. <laughs> until later that they until came later, and apologized you... and found out it was a very elderly lady. Oh, really? <laughs> who couldn't find a seat. Oh. And I was like, I thought, mm, I might've been a little tough. <laughs> But uh, it was becoming an issue because people were talking. But anyway, poor thing. Aww. But, uh, well, did she get to meet you? No. No. <laughs> no. And what happened like, with the cell phone? It just started going off and nobody yeah. was answering it? Or? I, sometimes we stop the show. If, but it was the worst possible moment in the show. It's a point where my character is appealing to the audience for understanding of a really traumatic moment. I won't get into the details, but it's about this kid that's haunting me. So this thing I did and, and I can't sleep. I, I, I go to bed and I, I, I always see his face. And through this whole speech, the phone is ringing and ringing. And I'm thinking, just let it go. This is not a time to stop the show. And finally, I could hear other people going, turn off your phone. All the time. So I said, oh, will, will you get it? You want to get it? You want to get that? Because I thought, what's coming up is even more important. And I right. thought, I have to stop now. But it was that moment when people don't turn off the phone because they've let it ring three times and it's too late to go for it. And they're thinking, I know, I'll pretend it's someone else's. So they're doing, oh. yeah, I could tell what was going on, they're doing that. And probably underneath, stamping on their bag to try and smash their phone, you know. But they must, I, then they it must have been so mo mortified, by the way. Can you imagine? So mortified. And then it stopped. And just as I'm about to start, it starts ringing again. Oh so whoever's God. like insistent. So, I, I mean, this is karma, by the way, because uh, Deb, who you know, my wife, is quite famous for two things, falling asleep in the theatre and leaving her phone on, right? And I remember ringing her one time. I didn't know where she was, and I rang her, and she goes, hello. I said, where are you? And she goes, I'm at the theatre. I said, and you answered the phone? I said, turn your phone off. She goes, no, no, no. I'll walk out. I'll talk to you in a sec. And then I hear this clunk, clunk, chairs falling. It was in this small theater. And she goes, oh, it's all right, I can talk now. I said, Deb, that is shocking. All right, so as you can see there, Hugh Jackman kind of interacting with the audience. And this is, for better or for worse, 
one of the biggest differences, of course, between a movie and a theater experience. Because when you're watching a movie, it's only a one-way street. If you yell at the, the movie, if you uh, throw popcorn at it or text while the movie is going or the TV is going, the screen doesn't respond. The screen doesn't see you. Whereas if you are in a theater, the energy you're giving the performers, when you laugh, uh, whether you're rifling your playbill, all of things add to the theater experience. It's not always a good one. Sometimes um, the theater is rude. Um, I bring up the Apollo here. For those of you who don't know, the Apollo Theater uh, is a theater where it's common for acts to get booed off the stage. Um, you know, some really famous artists have been booed off of the Apollo Theater because it's just a particularly hostile theater environment. Now, if you go to different kind of playhouses around the country, you know, some places it's considered rude not to stand up at the end. Some places clap more than others. Um, obviously, whether or not a theater serves alcohol kind of changes the tone of how things are going in the audience, um, especially stand-up comedy. Um, people tend to drink a lot in stand-up comedy and get more rowdy. Whereas if you're at the ballet or the opera, Things are much quieter and more civil, if you will. But it's part of the experience. If the person in front of you is texting the entire show, that's going to distract you. If the person behind you has a really odd laugh, you become part of the theater experience. And so um, when you write your critique paper, I'm interested to see what was your experience as an audience member. Not only how was the play, but how were the people around you? What did they look like? Did you feel like you were part of the group? Um, these are all important questions when we're talking about the theater. Um, so we're moving on to page 27. Oh, before I do, um, as an audience member, uh, you have a responsibility. <laughs> and I would be an amiss as an actor if I didn't please beg you to be a good audience member. Laugh when you find something funny. Um, don't make a lot of noise unnecessarily. Um, if you are planning to go see your play that you're going to write the critique over before uh, you get to later on in the chapter 4, I would please ask you to at least glance over the rules on page 74. Um, not all of them are going to apply all the time. Obviously, if you go to a dinner theater, you can eat there, but um, in general, you don't want to have loud snacking during a performance. Uh, it's just considered rude. Um, but, uh, you know, different theaters have different etiquette, and many of them will say straight in the curtain speech what they expect of you. And the curtain speech is what the director gives before the play starts. And not every play has a curtain speech, but many, by law, are required at least to point the fire exits out to you. And they should say then whether or not you can take pictures or videotape or anything like that. So most theaters, it's a no and no. Um... All right, so back to acting in film versus theater. Um, it has become popular for uh, movie, successful movie actors to kind of take their stab at Broadway. Um, you can imagine the commercial success that the theater enjoys when the uh, someone like Daniel Radcliffe decides to come and do a musical. Uh, it's a big pool. And... Um, Obviously, the biggest difference is in film, you make a lot more money. <laughs> Let's just be honest. There's a lot more money in film than there is in acting. And when these performers take roles in the theater, we understand that it is a charitable thing to do and they're not making a lot of money. But, um,. Let's just go over, spend the next few slides talking about some basic differences between acting and film. Um, a lot of the big names you may be familiar with are people who have gone from film and taken a stab at uh, the stage include Ethan Hawke, Alicia Silverstone, Jennifer Gardner, uh, Paul Rudd, Bradley Cooper, Julia Roberts. Um, in fact, I saw Jennifer Gardner in Serena de Bergiac with Kevin Klein, and uh, I was just say, not everybody can do both mediums. It's, it's a different kind of medium. I wasn't really impressed with Jennifer Gardner, even though I don't mind her on the screen. She was not necessarily a great stage actress, so... Um, 
as you can see on the left there, that's Sarah Noe de that's Kevin Kline, uh, portraying that famous role of the man with the big nose and an even bigger heart. Um, it was He was fantastic. He is spry and nimble, and I think he's in his 60s. I don't know. But he's very impressive. Jennifer Garner, less so. But you can see those sort of broad gestures that he's making with his arms, uh, big sweeping movements, nothing too subtle. Um, if he were to raise his eyebrow, the people in the back row couldn't hear, see that. That's just not something they can see in the scope of what it is. Whereas uh, there he is in French Kiss with Meg Ryan, that simple lift of the eyebrows means something when you're standing in front of a camera. Tadashi Suzuki calls it the art of stillness. Being quiet and being so sedated that even an eyebrow la lift means something or a slight grin out of the corner of your mouth is a really big gesture for the screen. So one of the biggest things to get used to is just the difference in the kind of gesturing. Um, when you're on stage, you need to find your light. You need to um, hit your mark, find your place on the stage. Whereas in screen, it's more about just stillness and controlling your body to the point where you don't even have to scratch your nose um, because it is more subtle. Um, so those are boom mics. Sometimes if you're watching bad TV, you'll actually see the boom dry up boom mic accidentally drop into the shot. Uh, it is the soundboard operator's job to hold that boom mic over so that it picks up the register of the actor's voice. So when you're in th film, you don't necessarily have to have a voice that projects or carries a long way. Um, it just has to be a normal speaking voice. Whereas if you're working in a big theater, now some are mic'd, I grant you, but even if you're mic'd, you have to be have a loud enough voice where that the lapel mic will pick it up. So in most theater circles, we as actors are taught how to project, speak loudly enough so that we're heard, but still in a pleasant tone. We're not shouting at you where you feel we're blowing you away, but we're speaking in clear, resonant, and dulcet tones so that you can enjoy and understand what we're saying in the theater. Um, so another kind of perk of being in film is often if you're in film you can memorize your lines for the day. You can see there um, Fred Armisen and Michael Sarah are kind of prepping for SNL which is Saturday Night Live. It's a TV show if you've never seen it before uh, but they have cue cards so those cue cards feed the lines to the actors and even though they familiarize themselves with the lines before they start they have the cue cards there to sort of prompt them about what to say next so if you can imagine um, on a set uh, you may have one monologue that you have to do that day but if you're Hamlet and Hamlet and you're walking on stage, you have to have two hours, two and a half hours, Hamlet's one of Shakespeare's longer plays, the entire thing memorized and ready to recite on cue. Um, and so that is quite a bit more of the ass work of the theater, the donkey work, the grunt work of memorizing it takes a lot more discipline than it does in film. Um, but it's also worth saying that film, there's a lot more waiting around. Um, you know, some of you may have heard that actors on a film site, they have their own trailer and, oh, they're such divas because they have trailers. But you have to remember that some of them will wait all day to shoot an hour's worth of content. So there's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of waiting for the light to ju be just right or for the crew to get everything set up the way they need to be. Um, don't mean to paint the film job as a simple or easy uh, job. Uh, so speaking of Saturday Night Live, this was an episode I saw where Ashley Simpson was going to lip sync her song rather than sing it, but she got out of sync with her lip sync, and uh, it was obvious at that point that she was trying to lip sync, and it was very mortifying. I felt so sorry for her watching it, but it is a Saturday Night Live is a live show. It's one of the few live shows that we have on television today, filmed before a live studio audience, and there was no do-over. She couldn't just say, hey, can we cut that out? Um, if you're on theater, one of the hardest things is knowing that at any minute you could go blank, 
and you could go up on your lines and be in front of the entire audience and the show must go on you know it's wonderful in film what they can do with the wonderful world of editing what an editor can sit down and sort of slice out all the mistakes or catch you from just the right angle um particularly shows like Larry David's uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm where they kind of just improvise and they may have uh, 20 hours of footage and they only end up with an hour in an episode um, because they're able to just kind of take as many takes as they want to sort of improvise the language and find the right words for what they're saying. So um, there's a real luxury in film of being able to cut, set that back up, you know, uh, and there's less fear, I would say, than a theater artist who has to just keep the show going no matter what. Um, so an actor's ensemble, uh, this is Katherine Hepburn, when she was at her peak in the 40s, she was asked to join the group theater, and the group theater was a training ensemble where they were very interested in getting into method acting, American method acting. Some names that you may recognize from the group theater are Elia Kazan, Harold Clerman, and um, Catherine Hepburn was asked to join the group theater, and she said, I don't want to be part of an ensemble. I want to be a star, you know. I want to see my name in lights. In theater, it tends towards group actors, uh, ensemble acting. People have to depend on each other. We have to distribute the lines kind of more evenly between the characters. Whereas film tends to have one person on the billing who we really want to see and tends to be more star driven. Now, it's not always the case, but um, theater tends to be a more ensemble oriented and film tends to be more star driven. We're looking for that one big name, that one person who's getting all the credit. Whereas ensemble in, in theater tends to be a group effort. And like I said, I'm not saying that acting in film isn't easy. We can distinguish between film actors who aren't good and those that, that are. Um, you know, some of my least favorite are Katie Holmes and Keanu Reeves. I just don't see a lot of expression. We hear unnatural ways of speaking. Um, not a big fan of Kristen Stewart. I think she doesn't make a lot of facial expressions. Um, but that just is a testament to those actors who are really good actors. You know, the Emma Watson um, is one that's often compared to Kristen Stewart here. Um, you know, being expressive enough to uh, read, register with your audience, but not so expressive that it's too loud uh, or you know too much for this for the screen I mean these are skills and real skills least of which especially if you're a woman keeping your body in shape you think about how some of these actresses work out three or four hours a day I listened to an interview the other day with Will Ferrell that said he jogs two hours a day and that's just to maintain a normal body weight that um, is presentable on, on camera. I mean it, it's a lot of work to stay in shape the way a lot of these actors do and it requires a lot of training. So um, whereas if we're in the theater looks are important but not nearly as much as they are for the film. The camera is brutal and Hollywood being thin 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 is definitely in vogue. Um, so just a confession, um, of course this is theater appreciation, I want you to appreciate theater, but one thing that film definitely has over theater is money, money, money. So you can see, um, uh, this week in the box office, when I'm recording this on August 20th, the, uh, this weekend... The movie Planes, which is another version of Cars put out by Pixar, made $13.39 million. $13.39 million, right? Whereas Annie, our top grossing Broadway show out of an entire week's profit, was $800,006.640. Right? This is really movies make a lot more than Broadway. So let's talk about some of the reasons that that is. Um, obviously, um, communication. When we're dealing with a movie, it goes off to thousands of seats, right, in theaters all across the country, whereas Annie is only selling to one house of a couple thousand seats, right? Um, you know, 
compared to the endless number of digital versions of a film that are out there, a Broadway experience is only allowed to sell as many tickets as butts can sit and fit in seats. So um, there's that. There's also the fact that theater is just more expensive to produce. Something like Cinderella, you think about those costumes have to be made and maintained. Think about the special effects that come, how many actors are dancing around the stage, and they have to have a salary. So remember what we said last class about actors and theater being a human experience. You know, I saw that Alice in Wonderland, and I know we're talking about Alice in Wonderland a lot as I'm directing it this semester at uh, Motlow, my main campus here. Um, and in Alice in Wonderland, the Tim Burton, I watched the behind the scenes. Everything is green screen. Everything is CGI, and the costumes even are added on later. Um, and theater, we don't have that luxury. We have to hand make the costumes. We have to um, work out the effects with smoke machines. And um, it's much more expensive than it is to do a CGI version. Um, so, uh or at least there's a bigger payoff for a Tim Burton movie in the end. So just thinking about the differences in money. Um, obviously, uh, for theater, we really can't replace it with machines. In um, theater, we have to feel out the cues. There has to be someone with some sense of musical timing sitting behind uh, the light board to change the transition when it feels right when Alice falls down the rabbit hole, for example. So that transition, those moments require um, someone with some timing, someone with some musical understanding. And so we need those human beings, and they cost money. They cost a lot of money to maintain. So um, uh, another reason why film is so much more lucrative than theater is because of the way that commercial industry packs up the film industry. So we have these products placements. We have commercials. Uh, you know, it's amazing if you look how much product placement is in uh, we're on page 33. Really funny to see how much uh, money is going to product placement. So in 2010, more than $10 billion were paid to the film industry to have their products strategically placed or weaved into a shot. $10 billion right? Um, I thought it was particularly interesting they were saying that the office wrote in episodes about shredding just to appease the um, appease the staples people. So uh, product placement is becoming big and even though theater could do something like that, there's just not the exposure or the incentives with big corporations to deal with theater. Um, so I wanted to take just a minute to talk about a small time theater. So here's one of our local theaters, the Nashville Shakespeare Fe Festival. Um, it's a wonderful organization that is free for people. It happens in Centennial Park. Highly recommend it. I should say that their summer productions happen in Centennial Park. Their uh, winter performances happen in the Trout Theater on Belmont's campus. But um, you can see how many government sponsors they have here, right? government spo sponsors. Now we'll talk a little bit more about the NEA in a minute, um, but the Arts Commission, an endowment, arts.gov, they're selling uh, bumper sticker or bumper, oh, what's that word called? Car tags, um, all to support this one organization, which is a relatively low budget endeavor. I mean, if you go, they're wearing regular clothes. It's not, no one's wearing sequins, but they also have cor corporate donors right, um, that get sponsorship set up in the playbills, right, um, a lot of them are the restaurants kind of surrounding where the Nashville Shakespeare is, and we'll talk about that again in a second. But then another thing that they have are just donors, right, if you have a PayPal account or a Visa, then you can just give them a tax deductible uh, donation. Now it's important to realize that these are all nonprofit organizations. So they don't pay taxes and the money that you give to them would be tax free if you itemize your deductions. So um, you could say I'm going to give them five dollars a month, right? Or I'm just going to call in and have one big lump sum. Um, then you would become a patron 
right? And your tax deductible donation would be part of the deal. So one of the big pluses that we have in the theater is booming the economy around us. So a lot of, if you open up a playbill, it's not a coincidence that a lot of the schools or the restaurants right next to the theater are going to be the ones who donate money because they have the best interest uh, in the theater's success. So this is my sister kissing me in Times Square on the cheek there. Um, Times Square, if you've ever been, is in the theater district. It's right there. Um, on Broadway, right, on 42nd Street, uh, and those streets are the theater district where the majority of the big Broadway houses with over a thousand seats are located, and um, it's no coincidence that booming economy has come around these theaters, and why Times Square is this big place to, um, you know, if you've ever watched the ball drop on New Year's, that's in Times Square. Um, these big, huge advertisements. But I was in London this summer in the West End. Well, coincidentally or not, around the West End, there are also big electronic billboards and this feeling of commercialism and booming success. And that has to do with if somebody comes to the theater, they're going to go to the shops near the theater on their way. They're going to say, hey, we're having a night out. We might as well eat a nice steak at Sardi's while we're over in the theater district. So all of the commerce around um, the theater district enjoys the wealth. And it's worth mentioning, too, that a lot of cities, not just New York, have kind of a place where a lot of their theaters are located. It's not an uncommon trend across the world. So the theater, the neighboring commercial business around a theater benefits from its um, its success. So they are often sponsors in a small or large way. Even a mom and pop shop uh, it can boost the local economy. So the NEA um, the NEA is a great program. PBS is one of the best uh, side effects of the NEA, the National Endowment of the Arts. Um, the NEA uh, gives grants to those of you who write them. Uh, it doesn't just affect theater, of course. It, it affects art, whether it be big or small, an after-school program, all the way up to helping to fund and keep open some of our museums here in the States. It is a USA. National Endowment for the Arts is a um, American enterprise. But it is worth noting that a lot of governments in Europe especially are much more generous with their arts programming. In fact, the U.S. is the least of any major industrialized nation. They give the least money to the arts, particularly to theater. In the U.S. budget, only 0.02% goes to the arts. Something like 54 cents a year of your money actually goes to the arts. And so um, it's just kind of important to think about where are we putting our money? Uh, are we supporting and creating art here in the U.S. Uh, that will live on in a legacy? Um, so that's me and Socrates and uh, a museum in London. When I was in Edinburgh and when I was in London, uh, all of the musician, the museum costs are paid. You are, f it's free to get into a lot of these museums. Now, not all of them, but most of the museums are free in Europe, and they're subsidized by the government because they believe it is a service that art should be part of our lives and should be something that we value and a service. So. Um, it's something to think about. Um, uh, what are we as a nation doing to thrive and help the arts? So I'm hoping that you guys get really rich and you can help change the way that America sees the arts. <laughs> um, so he said in the book that PBS has become the petroleum broadcasting system. And I thought that was really interesting. Some of you may remember in the uh, campaign, Mitt Romney said that he would do away with Big Bird. He would do away with PBS or any sort of government subsidies. Um, and that really offended a lot of artists to our core because great art has always come out of government sponsorship. If we look at Shakespeare, he was Lord Chamberlain's men. He was one of the Queen's men. He was sponsored by wealthy patrons in a government capacity. Um, if we look at the golden age of ancient Greece when Aristophanes and those great uh, tragic writers, Euripides wrote Antigone and uh, Oedip Oedipus was written by Sophocles. That was a time when the government was funding those projects. A wealthy patron would come in and they would say, as for your taxes for the state, you can either build a ship, 
as many of you know in ancient Greece they were big naval force or you can fund a play and so it leads to great art when great artists are supported and funded and given incentives for doing their best so the thought that our government is not behind us as artists is very disheartening to say the least but this uh, petroleum broadcasting system brings up what we're going to talk about next which is how much is television run by corporate sponsors and what is the danger in that but before we get to that it's important to think of American um, movies and TV shows as our biggest export people in China may not never may not ever actually talk to an American but they are going to watch Gossip Girl and they are going to see what they think American lifestyle is. In fact, your book goes this far to say, um, you know, it's going to make it easier to recruit in Afghanistan for uh, the rebel Taliban, which I think was a little bit extreme. But we as Americans are not always viewed very highly by other countries and perhaps part of that is the way that we're depicting these actors now is it fair for other countries to judge us based on stereotypes um, portrayed in films maybe not but it's still something that you need to know that people in China are watching television um, you know I think he said 90 percent of British people are still watching American television and they're forming opinions about Americans based on the way that they behave in these uh, television shows so if they watch Pawn Stars or uh, Duck Dynasty then they're gonna think oh, okay well that's what Americans in the South are like you know so it's just something to think about how are we perpetuating or putting ourselves out there not that I think there's anything wrong with Duck Dynasty no letters please no emails um so um he says in your book on page 41 he goes into starting to talk about all these multinational corporations general electric viacom uh, news corporation disney time warner sony um and the big question is if they're sponsors if they have so many interests if they're protecting the interest of um big oil or uh, how is that going to affect the kind of television programming that they have they're not going to produce movies about the evils of fracking or um, or living in a lifestyle that eats up a lot of our earth's natural resources if they have money and oil um, how are these corporations going to frame the way that we think or if they have a vested interest and beauty products are they going to cast ugly actresses probably not they're probably going to glamorize um, you know and portray perfect people because they have a vested interest in people wanting to be perfect um, you know the fine line between when your program sh goes off and the commercial starts is getting even more blurry as these big executives have a bigger say in what goes on on television it's just something to think about I know it kind of sounds like a conspiracy theory or sort of um, very negative and I don't mean to be but I, it is something to think about um, as you kind of tune out and just relax and watch TV ask yourselves are they just telling me what I want to hear or uh, is this the kind of TV show that can challenge me or make me a better person um, one line that kind of stuck out to me in our book was the the thought that perhaps it's the rise of trivial programming um, that they're no longer going to kind of give us anything that challenges us we're just going to kind of skate along the surface and enjoy entertainment which we talked about kind of the difference between entertainment and art um, so on the other hand theater is much like more likely to have a sincere artistic expression right the playwright it's theater is a playwright's medium film is a director's medium but theater is a playwright's medium where they get to sit down and speak what's in their heart and tell their story and for the most part where they don't have corporate sponsors editing them or you know sending in test groups to sort of clean it up or make it more friendly they're gonna get the honest truth of that person's story which 
is much more real, which we can kind of really listen to someone's opinion more th other than our own. We live in such a marginalized society where the lunatic fringe of the left or the right, um, you know, we find those opinions to back us up either on Fox News or MSNBC. We kind of find those left or right opinions that kind of back up our own beliefs. How often do we sit down and really listen to something with a different voice? Some examples, this is Angels in America, a very famous Tony Kushner play. Um, there's a gay theater here in Murfreesboro who does, they do a lot of plays about homosexuality and, and those plays are meant to sort of get people's attention or celebrate a culture um, and that goes out uncensored. Now there are some shows on television uh, that express those same themes but not until here recently. A lot of the programming that we see just sort of reaffirms what we already believe. All right moving over to page 44 we're talking about copyright. So just as an inventor creates a patent for their work a playwright has to get a copyright over there um, legally to protect their material. And the way that that happens is they go through a publisher and then we as theater artists have to apply to produce that show. For example, I just talked about Wicked last time, which is one of my favorite musicals going right now on Broadway in the West End and on tour. Um, I personally cannot just do a production of Wicked at my local theater because the playwright and um, also the composer in that instance is still privatizing that to Broadway, right? Um, so for example, for Alice in Wonderland, I had, to I had to contact Pioneer Drama. I had to get a copy of the script and read a, an interpretation of Alice in Wonderland. There are many found my favorite and then I have to pay royalty payment in order to use those authors words that playwrights words so I had to pay seven hundred and sixty dollars for 14 performances that's just to give you an idea and really in terms of plays that's a pretty cheap one seven hundred and sixty dollars I'm not even charging admission because it's a children's play and we bust in the surrounding ed uh, schools. So when you think about how much it costs to really have these um, copyrights go, it can really add to what theater, remember I said theater is much more expensive to produce than film in many cases, and uh, definitely less return. And copyright is part of that reason. Now not every um, play requires copyright. We have what's called the we have what's called the green lighted list. Uh, we have um, public domain. So after 70 years after a playwright dies, then those plays become public domain. They now belong to the general public and they don't require royalties. They don't require anybody to pay for to produce that work and we have a lot of interesting plays that will be coming up into the public domain and uh, I'll be sort of interested to see how that goes. But now remember that doesn't include ones that are sent through a translator. So for example, ancient Greek plays, those have to be translated and put into English. So I pay a translator and I have to continue paying royalties for that. But something like Shakespeare, it's a great example. <laughs> you wonder why, uh, as we said, the National Shakespeare, or these other Shakespeare festivals are able to keep their costs down and perform for free. Part of that is that Shakespeare is green lighted, it is royalty free, it is public domain, and nobody has to pay for it. So um, another thing to think about with royalties is you only pay for as much as in the script. Um, not only is the script copyrighted, but remember also songs. So if I was going to do Alice in Wonderland, which I am, and I wanted to include a song from the Disney Alice in Wonderland, well, I don't have the rights to do that because that song belongs to Disney and I am paying Pioneer Drama. Now if I were paying Disney for the Alice in Wonderland Junior version, then I would have the rights to those songs. Another thing to think about is that design is copyrighted. This is not the production, my production has yet to go on as I'm recording this. Uh, I couldn't design a dress exactly like the dress in this picture because that is a copyrighted design. That design is not public domain. So um, copyright it, infringes into all of our lives and I'm sure you've heard of copyright uh, before it's not probably a new concept for you 
So it's very different in the film industry. In the film industry, it is not a playwright's medium. Remember I said in the, the film industry, it's really a director's medium. Uh, what usually is the case, not always, but usually is the case, is you're just a writer for hire. They hire you to write the script. Once you hand it over to them, you're not involved in the process. You don't get to watch the production or the screening. After it's uh, out of your hands, then the director or the actor can cut it up and change it as much as they want to. Now, if I have Alice in Wonderland and uh, for some reason a lawyer came to watch my play to protect the copyright and they saw that I cut out half the play, they could actually sue me right we've had some famous versions of that the one in your book of course is that chorus line they took out all the cuss words and the song about a breast augmentation um, recently I went to a uh, community production where they did Jesus Christ Superstar and very famously at the end of Andrew Lloyd Webber's Jesus Christ Superstar there is no resurrection Jesus just dies well in this community version they decided to add back in a resurrection scene and they of course had to pay um, some penalty fines for that um, so in the theater we tend to guard what the writers originally wrote whereas in film you're a writer for hire you after it leaves your hand they can do pretty much whatever they want with it now there are exceptions um, for example Tony Kushner recently wrote Lincoln and uh, some of these big playwrights who get involved in the film process uh, they're more respected but for the most part a writer is not the biggest name in a film um, in fact it's kind of interesting I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were talking about one of the James Bond films happened during the writer's strike now the writer's strike happened because of these different mediums you know whether we sell an episode online or whether it's um, put out on DVD those uh, royalties were not going to the writers they were all going into these big conglomerates and so the writers were striking in order to get a fair piece of the pie that was coming with these extra profits and um, they did successfully strike and they and they got what they wanted um, but during the James Bond they were halfway through the shoot and so the lead actor and the director ended up just kind of having to make up some of the dialogue uh, during the writer's strike and of course that film has been one of the least successful of the James Bond movies but all of that to say writers even though they are in film and they are an important part they're not as respected the director is really the one who calls the shots and can do with the play with the script whatever they want so <coughs> um, just to review last class we talked a little bit about what is art and then what is theater what's the difference between entertainment right and um, just kind of skating along the surface as opposed to real contemplation that has often come about with uh, real art. Um, then today we've kind of moved over into the differences between film and theater. Theater being something that is not hopefully as corporate sponsored or corrupted by money but something more pure and honest from an artistic perspective. Whereas film uh, we know tends to be, and not always, but tends to be more commercial, more um, controlled by the people holding the purse strings and um, as such uh, can be more corrupted so it's just something to keep in mind theater and film are different um, for actors and for producers alike so um, signing off thank you once again for listening have a good day